use your signal, you cow! When you're stuck in traffic, it's easy to lose your temper. Sometimes we encounter other drivers so insanely idiotic that they make us question who decided to give them a license. Driving this poorly should be a crime. Sometimes it is, and the problem elegantly solves itself. But most of the time, the idiot just gets away scot-free. Not content with the unfairness of it all, a few of us will try to take justice into our own hands, often with less than fortunate results. Before you plan an act of road retribution, you may want to seek out wisdom from the experts. Boy, Brian Vickers, Dale Earnhardt Jr., that ain't gonna oh, work, boys! Motorsports feature the most talented drivers in the world, but they still succumb to the same emotions as the rest of us. With potentially millions of dollars on the line, patience on the racetrack runs very thin. Auto racing provides a unique opportunity for drivers to destroy each other's vehicles without any legal or financial repercussions. In series like NASCAR, the cars are durable enough to dish out some serious punishment without jeopardizing themselves. Most racing accidents are just that, accidents. But in NASCAR, a few wrecks are not just intentional, but premeditated. On track, the best drivers are just as skilled at retaliation as they are at racing. Revenge in NASCAR comes in many forms, some more elegant than others. Well, rule number one in stock car racing is learn how to wreck someone without wrecking yourself. The most proficient retaliators are discreet enough to make you think twice over whether or not it was even on purpose. But by far the most entertaining revenge is the opposite of discreet. In this video, I'm going to talk about seven cases of revenge so outrageously blatant that nobody could see it as anything other than pure, unadulterated retribution. Our first tale comes from the winding turns of Sonoma, California, one of the few road courses on the NASCAR schedule. These types of tracks give NASCAR drivers the opportunity to do something they rarely ever get to do, turn right. Oh, Rewind! That can't work! And Sonoma's most eventful right turn is without a doubt turn 11, a tight hairpin that forces drivers to decelerate from 120 to 40 miles per hour in just a few seconds. In one race, two drivers are about to get very familiar with turn 11 and each other. It's lap 37 of the 2011 Toyota Save Mart 350. Tony Stewart has a fast car, but he's stuck back in traffic. Tony's getting a bit frustrated with Brian Vickers, who refuses to give up his position. By the time they reach turn 11, Tony has had enough and dumps him. Oh, he locked it up! Vickers oh. around! During this time, Tony Stewart is one of the most formidable and aggressive drivers in the sport. If you raced him the wrong way, he would not hesitate to take you out of contention. Over the years, dozens of drivers have fallen prey to Stewart's retaliation. And for a moment, Vickers looked to be yet another victim. The race continues and Tony works his way through the pack. By lap 85, he's cruising to a top 5 finish when the broadcast cuts to commercial. When they come back, Tony Stewart has been sent to the Shadow Realm. It took Brian Vickers more than 50 laps to get back to Stewart, and when he did, he sure made the most of it. Vickers hooked Tony at the precise speed and angle to strand him on the tire barrier, knocking him out of the race entirely. A well-orchestrated act of payback, but one that would ultimately prove inconsequential in the grand scheme of things. Vickers may have won the battle that day, but it wouldn't stop Tony Stewart from eventually winning his third and final cup championship that season. At the very least though, Tony didn't wreck anyone else for a while after this. They say that revenge is a dish best served cold, and in NASCAR, some drivers prefer to bide their time before dishing out their payback. Oh, and Jimmy Johnson gets turned right in the front of Mark Martin. And he's not yeah. waiting to get in the ambulance, I don't think. I think, I think he's waiting to, to wave to his favorite driver right now. Let's see. In the 2000s, Robbie Gordon was possibly the only NASCAR driver more aggressive than Tony Stewart. Robbie was the racing embodiment of chaos. His decisions on the racetrack seemed to be governed entirely by impulse. He would do things on the track that seemed completely pointless to anyone else but him. This is just what drives me crazy. Robbie Gordon is worried about a lap car and he lets Tony Stewart take the lead. These loose cannon antics made him one of the most entertaining drivers to watch. He was the driver to boldly go where no other driver had gone before. Robbie Gordon, California kid, is going to win the Dodge Save Mart 350. Robbie Gordon was most well known as one of NASCAR's best road course racers, 
but his most bombastic moments would come at the Magic Mile in New Hampshire. In 2001, Robbie would infamously score his first ever NASCAR victory there by moving Jeff Gordon out of the way. In the 2004 race, he would get spun by Greg Biffle and then hunt him back down like a heat-seeking missile, taking out two other championship contenders in the process. But believe it or not, this wasn't even the best example of Robbie getting revenge at New Hampshire. So based on what we've seen so far, it's generally a bad idea to piss off Robbie Gordon on the racetrack. In the 2005 Sylvania 300, Michael Waltrip did just that. By this season, Robbie Gordon had become fed up with answering to any team owner above him, so he opened up his own team. He would run the 2005 campaign as NASCAR's only owner-driver. Financing your own race team comes with a lot of autonomy, but at the cost of a lot of, well, money. Any on-track mishaps would now have to come directly out of Robbie's own pocket. Considering his track record at that point, it was a pretty risky spot to be in. So how did Robbie do in his first year as his own boss? Pretty awful. By September, he has only one top 10 and has failed to qualify for four races. He's sitting a dreadful 36th in points, but he has a pretty decent run going at New Hampshire. That is until, while under caution, Michael Waltrip hooks him into the wall and totals his car. Needless to say, Robbie Gordon is not happy. About the 15, then he said, NASCAR, I hope you're listening. I will pay Michael Waltrip back. Robbie vows revenge against Michael, but after many months of inaction, everyone has pretty much forgotten about it. The following July, the Cup Series returns to New Hampshire. In 2006, Waltrip had become the co-owner of his own racing team, and just like Robbie the year before, he was struggling. Late in the race, Michael finds himself lined up behind who else but Robbie Gordon. Everyone else may have forgotten what happened the year prior, but Robbie sure hasn't. Our guy's trying to come back to us. How did that happen? He's crashed back there and broke yeah, the radio. Yeah. Robbie Gordon didn't have many victories in his NASCAR career, but when he did win, he made sure to do it in a way that was unmistakably his. Drivers like Robbie are all but extinct in NASCAR today. But back in the day, it was common to see lots of drivers march to the beat of their own drum. If you were looking for a driver to inspire excitement, then perhaps you'd find it in Mr. Excitement, Jimmy Spencer. It's gonna be a drag race to the checkered flag! Jimmy Spencer wins it! Jimmy Spencer would get into a litany of fights and altercations over the course of his career, but none was more heated than his feud with Kurt Busch. At the turn of the millennium, Kurt Busch was one of the fastest rising talents in the sport, in 2001, he was promoted to a full-time cup ride at just the age of 22. In his rookie season as NASCAR's newest phenom, Kurt Busch got rocked. He finished 27th in points with 7 DNFs, and his biggest highlight of the year was being the last guy Dale Earnhardt ever flipped off. It's tough being a rookie at NASCAR's highest level, a lesson Kurt learned in the 2001 Phoenix race where he got turned by Jimmy Spencer in front of the entire field. Welcome to the big leagues, kid. At this point in time, Jimmy Spencer is in the opposite position of Kurt Busch. He's in the twilight of his career and his best days are long behind him. But in the 2002 Food City 500 at Bristol, Jimmy Spencer has the opportunity to do something he hasn't done in nearly eight years, win a Cup Series race. He's running second with just 60 laps to go and reeling in the leader. The only problem is that the driver running first is the same guy Jimmy Spencer wrecked just five months earlier. Of course, Kurt doesn't cut Jimmy any slack. Oh, he hit him. Bush got under him and muscled Jimmy Spencer. You don't see that often. Now, Kurt Bush is a first-time Winston Cup winner at Bristol. On this day, youth prevails over experience. After the race, however, Spencer ominously warns that the young driver still has much to learn. There's a lot of things you can and can't do, and one thing you can't do is just beat and bang with people. And some guys have to learn. They just have to learn the hard way. Five months later at Indianapolis, Spencer punted Bush at over 180 miles per hour. He just booted him out of the way. Kurt is absolutely livid and trashes Spencer in the post wreck interview. We spun and that put us in a bad position back there with the decrepit old has beens, I guess. The feud continues to escalate until it reaches a boiling point in the next year's race at Michigan. Kurt swerves into Spencer trying to cut down one of his tires. After the race, Spencer reportedly marched over to Kurt's car and punched him in the face. Jimmy got out of the car, approached Kurt Busch, and actually punched Kurt Busch. Kurt left with a bloody nose and a chipped tooth, prompting NASCAR to suspend Jimmy Spencer for the next race. 
Now, at this point, it's important to recall that Jimmy Spencer has thus far demolished two of Kurt's race cars and his face, and the fans love him for it. The next race is littered with free Jimmy Spencer signs, and Mr. Excitement is arguably the most popular he's ever been. Sometimes a NASCAR feud represents more than just a simple disagreement between drivers. Kurt Busch and Jimmy Spencer symbolized a clash of generations in a changing sport. In the eyes of many fans at the time, Kurt Busch embodied a new wave of prima donna drivers who lacked the struggling grit of seasoned veterans like Jimmy Spencer. I mean, what happened last week was an assault after the race, and what had happened leading up to that in the past was I've got two wrecked race cars out of it, and I don't respect Jimmy Spencer. Back in the day, drivers would settle disputes among themselves without any interference from the sanctioning body. Many felt that NASCAR was babying down the sport to conform to a more mainstream image. Too bad for them, NASCAR was entering a new age whether they were ready or not. Just one year afterwards, Kurt Busch would sit atop the sport as champion. Not long after that, Jimmy Spencer would retire and find a new home on the Speed Channel. While Kurt got the best of him in their time as competitors, Jimmy Spencer always finds a way to have the last laugh. It's time for Kurt Busch Radio Sweetheart! Despite starting off as polar opposite rivals, Kurt Busch and Jimmy Spencer didn't end up being so different after all. NASCAR is always changing. Cry as you might, you can't stop the future. Boy, Kurt Busch in that two got such a run through the middle of three and four. Here comes his brother Kyle to the inside and almost wrecked him. I told you. Oh, there he goes. I told he did. you. One of Kurt Busch's many career rivalries was a sibling rivalry with his brother Kyle. If Kurt was a can't-miss talent, the younger Bush brother was a generational prodigy. While it took Kurt until age 23 to win in the Cup Series, Kyle did it at just 20, in his rookie season. Currently, he's in the conversation with Jeff Gordon and Jimmy Johnson as one of the greatest drivers of NASCAR's current era. In 2007, all three of these drivers raced on the same team, Hendrick Motorsports. Unfortunately, such great amassments of talent don't tend to stick around for very long, and come the middle of the season, Kyle Busch wants out at Hendrick. Just like his brother, Kyle Busch had the tendency to lose his temper, and had reportedly worn out his welcome with team owner Rick Hendrick. Despite his skirmish with Kurt in the All-Star Race, Kyle Busch's greatest rival wouldn't come from his brother. It would come from his replacement. By the mid-2000s, Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s race team was on a downward spiral, and he was about to become the biggest free agent in all of NASCAR. As the sport's most popular star, Dale Jr. would provide an immediate boon to any team that signed him. Naturally, one of the first team owners to approach Jr. was Rick Hendrick. Beyond the appeal of joining NASCAR's most successful team, Jr. bonded with Rick Hendrick on a very personal level. Both had suffered tragic losses of family members earlier in the decade, with all that considered, Earnhardt and Hendrick were a match that seemed destined to happen. It's the 2007 Samsung 500 at Texas. On lap 252, Tony Stewart spins and Kyle Busch rear ends Jr. in the scramble. Kyle thinks his car is total and retires from the race. Unbeknownst to him, however, his pit crew repairs the car and wants to send it back on track to pick up some extra points. The only problem is that Kyle Busch has gone AWOL. The team scurries to find a replacement driver just as Dale Jr. is pulling his wrecked car into the garage. Long story short, Dale Jr. ended up finishing the race in Kyle Busch's car that day. And so today, it is with great honor to introduce my new boss for 2008, Mr. Rick Hendrick. Was it a bizarre coincidence or perhaps a covert audition for his next ride? We may never know all the answers, but one thing's for sure. It wouldn't be the last incident involving Dale Jr. and Kyle Busch that season. Six months later, Kyle Busch is in a fierce battle for the point lead heading into Kansas, while Jr. is out of championship contention. By this point, it's well known that Earnhardt will be replacing Kyle Busch at the end of the season, but Kyle is still trying to make the most of his lame duck run by going out with a bang. Just 30 laps in, however, Jr. runs over Kyle Busch on the backstretch and takes him out of the race. After it was over, Junior apologized and said it was an accident, but Kyle Busch would not so easily forget the driver who cost him his first shot at a championship. I'm sure these guys that he's going to be working with next year don't really appreciate this because they've got a championship they can win this year and he doesn't. 
It's the spring of 2008, and Dale Jr. wants badly to win for his new team. He is currently in the midst of a 70 race winless streak. Meanwhile, Kyle Busch is riding high in his new Joe Gibbs Racing Toyota, winning two of the first nine races on the season. In the final laps at Richmond, Dale Jr. is just a few miles from victory. Kyle Busch, however, has other plans. Got him. Oh, I believe he's got him this time. Oh, he turned it! No! Oh, he turned oh, it! No! You know what, Daryl? I saw the wheels on the 18 car turn to the right just ever so slightly. One could say that the end of this race profoundly shaped the next few years in NASCAR. Kyle Busch finished 2008 with eight victories and was instantly rocketed to public enemy number one in the sport. A lot of people hated it. You know, I guess those are the ones with 88s tattooed on their arm. For Dale Jr., the incident would mark the beginning of the worst stretch of his career. After 2008, Jr. would not see victory lane for the next three seasons. In some cases, revenge can end up having far more influence than just a petty comeuppance. It can go on to define a driver's legacy. This event cemented Kyle Busch as a dominant villain and Dale Jr. as a lovable underdog who could never seem to catch a break. Two perceptions that neither driver could ever really overcome. Do you think that if Dale and Kyle could go back to this moment, history could have turned out differently? Well, the next time they went to Richmond, history repeated itself instead. Oh, oh, they got well. together. Revenge in NASCAR can greatly influence how we perceive other drivers, but very rarely does it influence the actual outcome of a season. Ryan Newman is going to get in with that move on the last lap. We said what would drivers do to make it happen? We just saw what they would do. In 2014, NASCAR introduced the controversial elimination-style playoff format, an unintended consequence of which was giving drivers tremendous leverage and potentially spoiling the competition. If you're going to have a feud in NASCAR, you absolutely do not want to start one in the playoffs. So let's talk about Martinsville. It's the oldest remaining track on the NASCAR schedule, which really shows from its unique design. Remember Turn 11 from Sonoma? Well, double it back, and that's basically the entire Martinsville racetrack. Of course, the close quarters racing creates the perfect breeding ground for tempers to flare. With the added pressure of the playoffs, the fall Martinsville race turns the intensity up to 11. Denny Hamlin had always been one of NASCAR's most consistent drivers, but he could never quite put it together when it counted most. Every time he found himself in position to contend for the championship, he would always end up suffering some inexplicable mishap. Heading into the 2017 playoff race at Martinsville, he's sitting 6th in points. If he wants to advance to the championship finale, he's going to have to catch a serious break. Chase Elliott is in quite a different place than Denny. He's not just looking for his first career championship, he's looking for his first career win. At age 21, he's in just his second full-time cup season, but the expectations surrounding him are about as high as any other prospect the sport has ever seen. Chase Elliott is a part of racing royalty. The son of NASCAR legend Bill Elliott, he has spent the past half decade as NASCAR's most anticipated young star. By 2017, he's next in line behind Dale Jr. as the sport's perennial most popular driver. But more than 70 races into his cup career, he still has yet to win at NASCAR's highest level. Today at Martinsville, Chase has a pretty good shot at finally breaking through to victory lane. Winning here wouldn't just validate the talent of the young phenom, it would punch his ticket to the championship race. He's led over 100 laps so far, and with just 4 laps to go, he pulls ahead of the field and looks to be cruising to a fairy tale ending. Too bad for Chase, the driver behind him is Denny Hamlin, who is not about to let another opportunity go to waste. The bumper to the back of the 24! Oh Elliott goes around, Hamlin takes the lead and the caution comes out! Chase Elliott did not win on this day, but luckily for our story, neither did Hamlin. Denny swung for the fences in the closing laps of this race, but in doing so, he just made himself the biggest target in NASCAR. Racing hard for the win here, Denny, what happened? Trying to get uh, trying to get a race win, but you know it's uh, everybody wrecked everyone there at the end. It was I'm not sitting here uh, saying that I wrecked them on purpose, and I uh, tried to move them out of the way and spun out. It's now one race before the championship finale. In the closing laps, Denny Hamlin is holding on to the final transfer spot by the slimmest of margins. It was at this point that Chase Elliott taught Hamlin a lesson in why you should never mess with racing royalty. Oh, into the wall goes the 11! The 24! Pitch the 
11 into the wall. And now, tire smoke coming out of the 11. Oh, there Junior, is. and there with the tire. The 11 okay, goes up the wall. That could be the championship hopes going up in smoke for Denny Hamlin. Believe it or not, this wasn't the first time the driver of the 24 car got revenge at Phoenix for something that happened at Martinsville. The 40th career victory and the 11th win of 1998 goes to Jeff Gordon and the Rainbow Warriors. Of course, the former driver of the 24 car was none other than Jeff Gordon, who was in the conversation for the greatest stock car driver ever. In 1998, he drove the greatest statistical season in NASCAR's modern era, scoring an unthinkable average finish of 5.7. His 2012 season, on the other hand, was not quite as spectacular. After the first five races, he is sitting a dismal 25th in the point standings. He's looking to turn his luck around at Martinsville. Winning here would have extra significance because at this point, Hendrick Motorsports is sitting at 199 wins. For the whole season, everyone has been wondering which Hendrick driver will take the honor of scoring win number 200 for the team. So far, no Hendrick driver has won in 2012, but on this day, it certainly looks like it's going to happen. With 10 laps to go, Jeff Gordon is in an amazing battle with his teammate Jimmy Johnson, so it looks like, barring a completely preposterous turn of events, that Rick Hendrick will get his 200th victory. Just as Gordon makes the pass on Johnson with 5 to go, the caution comes out. For reasons we still don't understand to this day, David Rudiman doesn't come to pit road during an obvious mechanical issue and stalls out on the front stretch. The field lines back up and the two Hendrick cars look to settle it on what should be the final restart. The only problem now is that they're on worn tires and are sitting ducks to the pack behind them who pitted for fresh tires. Restart Looks like to me possibly Clint Boyer in the 15 won the battle off pit road. That's the guy you better keep an eye on. Well, the green flag drops and both Hendrick cars get a poor jump off the line. Simultaneously, Ryan Newman gives one of the biggest shoves in Martinsville history to Clint Boyer, who's directly behind the Hendrick cars. With nowhere else to really go, Boyer makes the split-second decision to dive bomb inside of Jeff Gordon. Three wide, in a turn one, at Martinsville. This went about as well as you may have guessed. Boyer, shot, get down! Uh, three wide, three wide. There goes and Newman! Oh, Newman's gonna man. take the lead! That was not pretty. Clint Boyer was a driver who always seemed to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. He is perhaps best known for finishing the 07 Daytona 500 upside down. He was still talented enough to occasionally win a race or two, but whenever Clint found success, misfortune always seemed to follow. The 2012 race at Martinsville is no exception. Looking back, it's hard to say Clint did anything wrong in this situation, but he still ended up bearing the brunt of the controversy. Well, Clint and I are friends, you know, and I, I have a lot of respect for him. He's a great race car driver, and I'm glad I talked to him before I talked to you guys, because I was pretty mad at him. After the race, Jeff Gordon is merciful. Their next altercation, however, wouldn't be on such pleasant terms. Six months later, the Cup Series returns to Martinsville, and the complexion of the season looks very different. With just four races left, the championship picture is wide open. After the worst start to a year he's ever had, Jeff Gordon has made a remarkable late season comeback to put himself within striking distance of the title. Right in the hunt with Gordon is Clint Boyer, who is having the season of his life. Late in the race at Martinsville, the two make contact in a hard-fought side-by-side -side battle. This time, Jeff Gordon is not as forgiving. After a second run-in on the season, Clint Boyer is skating on thin ice. Two weeks later at Phoenix, Clint Boyer is closer to the championship than he's ever been. Late in the day, he's running in the top five and is less than 30 points behind the championship leader. It's at this moment when Boyer runs into who else but Jeff Gordon. Unfortunately for Boyer, this is the straw that broke the camel's back. Where is he? I'm getting his ass. He's turning Clint Boyer into the wall. He basically waited on Clint Boyer to come around and took him out. It's still surreal watching this back today, nearly a decade afterwards. Jeff Gordon hunted down Boyer like a dog and erased his championship hopes in one flick of the steering wheel. What ensued was possibly the biggest melee in the history of NASCAR. But for as many punches that were thrown that day, it didn't change the outcome. Clint Boyer would go on to lose the championship by just 39 points. If Gordon doesn't take him out, it's very possible he could have won the whole thing. Boyer would never again come as close to winning a Cup Series title. Jeff Gordon is a racing god. He can give and he can take away.
It's hard to imagine a moment in NASCAR more savage than Gordon's revenge on Clint Boyer, but believe it or not, there is one incident that tops it, mostly because it came from such an unlikely source. Matt Kenseth comes to the line, finishing fourth, and Matt Kenseth is the 2003 NASCAR Winston Cup Series champion. If I could use one word to describe Matt Kenseth's career in NASCAR, it would be overshadowed. If you asked fans to list off the best drivers of the 21st century, many of them would probably forget to mention him. In 2003, he put together one of the most dominant seasons in recent memory, only to have it continually discredited because he only won a single race. Many have inferred that Kenseth's 2003 season directly persuaded NASCAR to overhaul the entire championship format to make sure that a performance like it could never happen again. So what exactly is the problem with a guy like Matt Kenseth nearly leading the points wire to wire? Well, the thing is that Matt Kenseth was not exactly the most exciting driver. He had a rather milquetoast personality which many considered to be downright boring to watch. But Matt's relative non-intrigue served more as a testament to how good he was at staying out of trouble. He always played it cool with the media and avoided drama like the plague. On track, he was one of the cleanest and most respectful drivers out there. It was really difficult to recall any examples of Matt Kenseth intentionally wrecking someone in a race. On the very few occasions he did end up in an altercation, he always seemed to take much more punishment than he dished out. So remember Brian Vickers from Chapter 1? Well, getting revenge on Tony Stewart must have awoken some kind of demon within him, because later that season at Martinsville, Vickers went on possibly the biggest rampage in NASCAR history. Throughout the race, Vickers takes out Regan Smith, Montoya, Jamie McMurray, and then starts beating and banging on Matt Kenseth, who at that moment is battling for the championship lead. Kenseth tries to put an end to Vickers' reign of terror by punting him out of the way, but that only makes him the sole target of the wrath. Just a few laps later, Vickers plows into the back of Kenseth, who goes on to finish outside of the top 30. Not content with just one act of vengeance, however, Vickers would take out Kenseth again two weeks later at Phoenix. Needless to say, Matt Kenseth didn't end up winning the championship this season. Keep in mind, this happened just one year before Jeff Gordon cost Clint Boyer the championship at the same track and nearly started a riot. After Vickers did the same thing to Kenseth, this is what Matt had to say. It's just unfortunate, but we'll just move on, keep working on it, and uh, you know, hope to have a better week next week. That's just the kind of guy Matt was. It was that hard to make him mad. In 2013, Matt Kenseth departed from longtime team owner Jack Roush to race the 20 car for Joe Gibbs Racing. The driver he replaced was Joey Logano, who is far and away the most controversial driver in the sport today. And boy, Tony Stewart is after Logano. What the hell do you think I was mad about? Dumb little s runs us clear down to the infield. He wants to b about everybody else, and he's the one that drives like a little b I'm gonna bust his ass. There's just something about Logano that really rubs people the wrong way. He was at one point the most highly touted NASCAR prospect ever, literally earning the moniker of the greatest thing since sliced bread. The immense amount of media hype surrounding his rise through the ranks made it tough to root for the guy early on. It didn't help that his racing style got on the nerves of many fans and drivers. When you get right down to it, Joey Logano is a dirty driver. When the chips are down, he will resort to cheap tactics if that's what it takes to win. He'll block someone with a huge run and risk wrecking the whole field. He'll slam someone into the wall if he knows they're going to pass him. He'll move a 53-year-old Mark Martin out of the way rather than going through the inconvenience of racing him clean for the win. I got dumped. Flat out just drove straight in the corner and wrecked me. It's the same thing. Somebody throws a stupid block that's never going to work, wrecks half the field, and then goes, eh. You know, I'm tired of these guys doing that stuff, and, and especially out of a kid that's been griping about everybody else. He's run his mouth long enough, he's sat there and done this double standard, and he's nothing but a little rich kid that has never had to work in his life. Being a recklessly inconsiderate driver isn't necessarily a bad thing, but the difference between Logano and someone like Dale Earnhardt is that Joey doesn't own it in a cool way. He still likes to carry himself as the innocent babyface who's never done anything wrong. I'm sure that off the track, Joey Logano is a really great guy, but when he gets behind the wheel, it's hard to find a driver less likable. Middletown, Connecticut's Joey Logano wins the Daytona 500. By 2015, the hatred for Joey Logano was reaching an all-time high. 
He's having the best statistical season of his career and looks poised to take the championship. One of his biggest challengers for the title is Matt Kenseth, who has won five races through 28 events, the most in the series. In a playoff format where winning races is practically the only thing that matters, the season's winningest driver has a pretty good shot to take the championship. The drama begins at Charlotte. Joey Logano wins, locking himself into the next round. Matt Kenseth finishes almost dead last after wrecking early, putting himself in a virtual must-win situation. The next week at Kansas, he's looking to do just that. He's dominated the race, leading more than half the laps in the event. The only other driver who's been able to contend with him all day is Joey Logano. Now let me reiterate here that Joey is locked in to the next round. He has nothing to gain from challenging Matt Kenseth for the win. It just doesn't make strategic sense to escalate things here. But in this situation, Joey Logano's probably not thinking about strategy. He's been around for a while now and knows that Matt's an easy target. A guy who got pushed around for his whole career and never once did a damn thing about it. Joey doesn't do what he does next because it's a smart racing move. He does it because he knows he can get away with it. And around goes the 20, sideways in front of the 22! Many modern NASCAR fans consider the 2015 season to be one of the worst in recent memory. A combination of subpar racing, inconsistent meddling from the sanctioning body, and season-long dominance from the sport's least popular drivers left most fans desperate for something to be excited about. Unfortunately for them, the following race would be the most miserable yet. The race ended under dubious circumstances after Kevin Harvick wrecked the whole field on the final restart. Dale Jr. came gut-wrenchingly close to saving himself from elimination, but he never even had a chance to race for the win. As the caution flag flies, the sport's most popular driver is just edged out by Joey Logano. Amidst the chaos and controversy, Matt Kenseth is quietly eliminated from his last great shot at winning the championship. In this moment, NASCAR is entering the dark timeline. The fans have been beaten and broken down. If they want to salvage any hope out of this season, they're gonna need a hero. You make decisions every day, you make decisions every minute behind the wheel. Um, to me, strategically, that doesn't seem like such a great decision for him, um, but it's the one he made and that's how he wanted to win. Oh, yeah, goes to 20! And the Bay cleared by Logano, maybe no! Statistically speaking, there's no doubt that Joey Logano was the best driver of the 2015 season. In hindsight, it's difficult to imagine a scenario where he doesn't win the championship. He would have to succumb to a cataclysmic event and a stupidly gimmicked point system. Unfortunately for Joey, he was a victim of both, but only one of these things was out of his control. Joey Logano always wanted to have his cake and eat it too and he would find out that doing so is a quick way to end up with no cake at all. Immediately afterwards, NASCAR suspended Matt Kenseth for two races. Not that it really mattered at that point. Joey Logano would go on to miss the championship race, and he learned an important lesson. The problem with taking from someone when you have nothing to gain is that one day, that person may wind up with nothing to lose. Throughout his career, Matt Kenseth was never really a popular driver, but in that moment, all of us were Matt Kenseth fans. In a way, Matt Kenseth helped everyone get revenge on Joey Logano. Well, unless you were a Logano fan, but nobody really cares about them. Revenge tells many different kinds of stories across racing. Stories about greed, ego, respect, legacy, change, chaos, and justice. These stories are all unique in their own right, but most of them end in the same way. The story of revenge is ultimately a story of forgiveness. Although revenge can provide us with some of the most captivating moments in auto racing, there's a reason it's ultimately rare. In NASCAR, vengeful vendettas inevitably leave behind a trail of wrecked race cars, poor finishes, and shattered dreams. In the game of revenge, everybody loses. Most drivers simply choose not to play. 
So the next time you're on the road and feel like carrying out your own piece of revenge, it's probably best to just turn the other cheek. Hey everyone, Emp Media back again to bring you another fantastic toy review, as if the downward spiral couldn't get low enough. Today I'm pleased to announce that I've partnered with the fine people at U2's Collectible Figurines to bring you the Emperor Lemon U2's. So I worked with U2's to design everything you see here, the figurine, the packages. So go ahead and give them some of your hard-earned cash, because a percentage of it goes to me. Uh, hopefully I get enough royalties from this to cover the lawsuit from Disney. But I do like this box. Like, it has the, your colors, you know, the green, the purple, the downward spiral. They sculpted the uh, tongue and teeth individually. That's a nice touch. I can really be tasting the money with this one. Yeah, it's, I'm actually really impressed by uh, the way that they, that they make these. I mean, this is... Kind of cool because this is like your your avatar character. Oh god, avatar. I'm gonna get sued by Nickelodeon too. But you know, you gotta love the attention to detail. It's even got a little mini downward spiral on the microphone. Do I have your disposable income now? And keep in mind, this is a limited edition figure, meaning that once the initial run is over, they're gone for good. Wow, I guess there will never ever be another collectible figurine like this one. Well, you better get one while you still have a chance, because these are probably going to go really fast, I imagine. These are going to go faster than I left the Sodi podcast. So head out to the website and start hoarding these things like fat housewives at Walmart on Black Friday. Man, hopefully these will sell better than my NFTs. Bruh. These bruh, 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 bruh. Yeah. Grand damn! Get some for Harambe. <sighs> I'm awfully glad for you. How exciting. I mean, it, it makes sense, right? Because having a U2's figurine validates you as an actual public figure. Of course, nobody knows who I am. So, I mean, why would they reach out to me? That'd be ridiculous. Why would U2's reach out to me and offer me a figurine? I mean, everyone else has one. Even you have one. Sorry, Rusty. This is something only YouTubers with U2s can understand. I just remember, he's going to have to run 42 laps, so he's going to be close on fuel. Oh, and he's really slowing down, too, Larry. I mean, 80 and uh, 28 looks to be like he's really close enough for in a hurry now. Two laps to go this time. Tony Stewart draws a bead on Terry Labonte for third place. I heard, him, I heard somebody say, and I think it was Nadeau, that says something was happening to the car. There's Stewart, makes the pass for third place, our pole sitter. And it's over. What happened? 